and we're lucky today to have Michael Santiago. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm just going to hand it off to him to speak a little about, about, about himself and his work, and afterward we can do a Q&A. So everyone's welcome to just come all the way in, and I'll pass it off to you. So hello, uh, my name is Michael Santiago. I've, I guess I would say I've been a professional photographer for the last two years. Um, I'm currently on staff at the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. And the photo that I have here is um, this photo of Julius Tillery, who's a kind farmer in North Carolina. And I've been working on a project on black farmers in America for the last five years. And it started out with um, looking at healthy eating in Oakland, looking at food deserts and where the residents their food from and I ended up finding a farmers market that specifically got their, fo their food from black farmers and in California that surprised me because in California all the farmers out there for the most part are large farmers um, farming uh, almonds and tomatoes and onions and they're all white farmers so the fact that it was black farmers is, it intrigued me and I kept digging and doing research I ended up finding a couple of black farmers there and I met Julius about a couple of years ago, and his family has been farming uh, cotton and soybean for the last 100 years. Um, his um, great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather's D.L. Tillery was the first Tillery to be born free in slavery. And he started farming cotton and soybean there. It started off at 46 acres, and now the family now has over, four, over 400 acres of, of, of farmland out there. And for the most part, in that area of North Carolina, all the farmers are black farmers. Um, and it's intriguing because um, a lot of the families that are there are there because of the New Deal. The New Deal that was started, that was imposed by Franklin Roosevelt um, to basically start up the economy after, after the Depression. And what that did it was that that brought families from all across America. And, and, um, I'm getting all nervous, the camera on my face. <laughs> but uh, for the most part, it's like the one besides uh, Mississippi is the one other state in America where it's, co where it's concentrated with black farmers. And right now, the, um, the farmers there, the, it's a collective of, of farmers. It's, it's pretty much the only way that they can uh, make enough money to be self-sustained out there. And there's a collective of about 20 different kind of farmers out there. Um, and what he's trying to do, uh, Julius is trying to just change the narrative of, well, around what it means to be a black farmer in America. When you think of um, cotton farming in America, you think of slavery, and he's trying to change that narrative. He's trying to encourage uh, other black farmers to, to um, basically raise cotton. He's also, he works for the Conservation Fund in North Carolina, and through that he's able to travel to different conferences throughout America. And typically, he's only the, he's usually the only black farmer there, and usually the only farmer that farms cotton there. So he's trying to change that narrative. And one of the things that he's trying to do now is that he's trying to establish an uh, internship program in North Carolina to encourage young African Americans to get into farming, especially cotton farming. Um, recently, he's been having issues because of the tariffs that has been imposed, um, and. The tires are, are hurting farmers who um, who farm soybean, and that's not one of the crops that he uh, that he farms. Um, the business that he started is called uh, Black Cotton, and with that, he's basically making the like home decor. Yeah, kind of a little lost. Any questions? What were the challenges you had in uh, pursuing this project? Honestly. From the get-go with this project, besides North Carolina, has always been about funding. Um, I've basically self-funded every single one of the projects. Um, when I first started, I was in college, so I was like, I wasn't eating, I wasn't paying bills just so I could rent money, uh, rent cars to go out to go out there because the farms have typically have been about four and a half hours. Um, when I live in California right now, this is in North Carolina, so like I got to fly out there. So it's always been about funding. I, I don't think that I've done enough justice to this work because I haven't been able to get out there and produce the work because it's being self-funded. Um, I've won a couple of grants which have helped out. Um, but for the most part, it's helped pay the bills, but not enough to get out there and work on this. Um, like I wanted to go out there this early this year to North Carolina when he was starting to um, plant all the, all, the, all the crops this year and I wasn't able to get out there. 
And now they're at the point right now where they're getting ready to harvest the crop. So I'm trying to find money to get out there again now so I can be out there for the harvest. Um, that's typically been like the only problem with that because I, I basically have a Rolodex of black farmers throughout America. So I have the people, but it's just getting to those people. And that's been the whole problem. Farmers that uh, for, farm uh, besides cotton, corn, uh, sugar cane, um, soybean, uh, I have connections to farmers in Florida which are being kept out of the marijuana industry out there as well. Um, there's farmers in Memphis right now, which I wish I could be out of Memphis right now because what's happened in Memphis is that a lot of the black farmers out there, they were sold bad seeds. And when you sold bad seeds, you can't have crops. When you can't have crops, you can't produce, you can't pay all your bills. The biggest story right now in Memphis and that's basically financial. Um, the daily stuff has helped because I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not out there all every single day shooting sexy stuff, you know, like there's, you know, ribbon cutting, uh, farmer's markets, um, people doing yoga, you know, so it's kind of like simply so things that we find mundane, like in a way, like, you know, like, but. And when I go out there and I have to photograph these stuff, I have to go out there and make these things look exciting and fun. Um, if it's empty, I have to make sure to make it look like it's a lot of people there. Um, I went out and I, I went out. Pittsburgh right now is one of the most segregated cities in America. I had an assignment when I, when I got out there, they were like, oh, go out there and make it look diverse. I looked around and I'm like, yeah, there's nothing but white people here. I cannot make this look diverse. So you have to figure out ways to make things look a certain way. So that, that helps out in my own personal work because it helps me see differently, think differently. Um, not only that, when you're a photographer at a newspaper, you have to learn how to become an editor and you have to learn how to edit your work to send in your best images. You can't, it's not like when you're in college where you can send in like 20 images and have your professor look at all your work. Um, you have to send in your best four to five images. So you have to learn how to be uh, uh, your best editor. If you weren't born into land, you have to buy land. And in order to buy land, you have to get loans. And for the most part, the people who run the lending agencies, the USDA, they are, for the most, they're all white farmers on there. So there's nobody who looks like you on there. And one of the first farmers that I worked with, his land was going into foreclosure and he went to get a loan. And the people on that board denied him the loan. And the head lending person went and bought that property and sold it for a profit. So that's something that you see happening all the time in America when it comes to black farmers. And one of the things that you can think about is that when you, if you want to trace the trail of stolen land in America, all you got to do is, tr is, is follow the lynching in America. Because a lot of farmers were lynched for their property. Um, they were lynched by neighbors who were jealous of the amount of property they had. Um, they were lynched by neighbors because they wanted their cows and, fa um, cows and pigs. And for the most part in America, like a lot of the USDA, they, there's really, there's rarely black farmers on, on those, on those agencies. Did you um, shoot the bad seeds? I'm sorry? Did you shoot them holding the bad seeds? Nah, I mean, I, I mean, I, I, I can't get to Memphis. Uh, I mean, I need somebody to spot, yeah. Before, when they started the actual... No, 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 because this, this is actually just, this just happened this year. This came out like maybe about a month ago with that, um, so right now there's a lawsuit going on right now. Um, but there's been lawsuits with the USDA and NGC since the 90s. Uh, the biggest one has been the Pickford, law, um, the Pickford lawsuits. And that basically what happened is a group of black farmers, they were, they were noticing that they weren't, they weren't being approved for loans. And if they weren't being approved for loans, it would happen 300 days afterwards. Like white farmers were getting approved for loans 30 days. Black farmers were getting approved for loans 300 days after they applied. So what ends up happening is that if you have bills, you can't pay because you don't have that money. Um, so it's, it's been systemic and it's, I would like to say that things have changed for the better, but they haven't, they've improved, but farmers are still dealing with the same issues. And it's not just black farmers, it's also white farmers that are, that are, that are being affected by this now, but it's just, it's just something that has been happening to black, to, to black farmers for a while. And, um, recently there's been stats that black farmers in America, they're, they're rising. But what's happened is that now in America, you have a lot of urban farmers that are, that are popping up all over the place. And that's being counted as, far, as, far, as farmers. Like freelance 
Yeah, exactly. You know, back in the day, in order for you to be considered a farmer, you had to have over a quarter acre of land. Now, all you got to have is a plot, and you, and you're raising like corns and vegetables and stuff like that. Now, you're considered a farmer. So they're taking those numbers and adding that to the stats. So when you look at the numbers, the numbers really aren't all that great. I, I want to say that right now, there's about roughly 44,000 black farmers in America right now, and that accounts for less than 2% of the farmers in America. So, does your newspaper have a magazine so that you can we, split, split the bait? I mean, we have a weekly magazine, but they ain't looking at this stuff. And that, that answer that? No. Have you been able to shop it with other publications? Um, can you do that? I've been trying. I mean, like the New York Times published one of the one of the projects last year, two years ago. But ever since then, I've been shopping it around. People Have are you like. Have talked to Ms. Dempsey? Jessica uh, Dempsey? No. The deputy photo editor of the New York Times. Not yet. Magazine. Not yet. Okay. <laughs> I'm looking this at is, you. This <laughs> <is>. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, but I, I've had feelings on the project. I mean, Al Jazeera, before they went to front, they, they were interested in it. Uh, the Atlantic was interested, and then they backed out. Um, I mean, but I've the had... The is not backed out, right? No, they published it a couple of years ago, but they published oh. one of the farmers. Oh. No, I, I mean, I've, I've, been, I've worked with two different farmers, so okay, well, three I different farmers. Okay, I give you $100 towards your trip. Thank you. <laughs> I give you 100 so that's the start. Yeah, yeah. What's up? Appreciate it. That's what's up. <laughs> Why this print? When I first started like putting this work out, for the most part, it was um it was older farmers like the, the Mr. McGill is about seventy six years old. Um, Miss Shirley, she's in her seventies also, and Julius is he's twenty nine, twenty eight, twenty nine. He's a young African American man, farmer kind, and I felt that that was important because his big thing is that he wants to he wants to encourage people to to become farmers um when he he never saw himself being a farmer when he was young uh he used to get picked on because he used to go to school and he used to be all dusty from picking peanuts so he didn't he didn't like he didn't want to become a farmer because of that the chore that his parents made him do so when he got older he went to act school and he you know learned more about farming learned about his history learned about why his parents were farming and like right he says that he wants to be the the p diddy of kind uh, <laughs> You know, and he wants to inspire people to just become farmers and just do this because, uh, for the most part, certain people are getting rich off of, off of farming and it, it ain't, they don't look like us. I mean, when you think about, when you think about marijuana right now, marijuana is like, it's like a multi-billion dollar industry right now. And the only people who are farming marijuana are, are white folks. Um, Florida is one of the biggest states for, for American marijuana planting. And... The law that Rick Scott put on was that in order for you to grow marijuana, your family has to always have to have always farm marijuana. And it was the black folks out there doing it. So, I mean, when you look at, when you look at the prison system, how many, how many people are in jail, how many black and brown people are in jail right now for marijuana, and who's making money off of it right now? Um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you always see enough, I didn't mean to curse. Uh, you always see things on Twitter of like, uh, new this new pop-up um, you know do yoga and smoke some weed uh, do this and do that smoke some weed the people who are out there benefiting it's always a, black, a white person in those photos but then a couple of weeks ago you had a young man in his house get killed by a cop and it came out that they, they had a search warrant and they found marijuana in his house but yet you know what I'm saying you have these other like whenever, whenever it comes to marijuana it's always like white folks who are always in a positive light but then when it comes to black and brown folks when it comes to marijuana it's a, di it's a different stance um, so when you think about like who's 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 benefiting off of marijuana right now, who's always on the flip side of that and inside of that. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank you. <laughs>